Well, hello, Stephanie. Thank you very much for joining us to record this podcast. Hello. Thanks for having me. So I finished reading your book today, um, Leftism Reinvented, Western Parties from Socialism to Neoliberalism. It's a great read. There's clearly, it's clearly a labor of love, a lot of work and labor went into this book and you cover a lot of territory. But um, before we get into the specifics of the argument and, and what the book is about, maybe you can tell our listeners just the, the background, the, the, the motivation for writing this book. Sure. Um, well, partly, you know, all these, these kinds of things are always biographical to some extent. So partly it just had to do with my own sort of biographical trajectory. I grew up in the D.C. area. I was, um, my, my father is a Keynesian economist. <laughs> okay, um, yeah worked for the government and, um, and um, during the, the Reagan years, it was clear that um, economics, it was clear even to me then that economics was not a purely, uh, was not a nonpartisan <laughs> science. Um, and, um, and then I sort of came of age politically during the, the Clinton years and um, I think had the experience of a lot of people um, in, in the US and, and in Western Europe as well, those years of being um, sort of um, um, excited and then having this sense of disappointment um, about how, how that period went um, for center left politics. Um, so, and also just kind of left, left me with this enduring um, confusion, right, about, about what happened um, in the American context, in particular, the promises that, that the Clinton Democrats made, especially to working class people, um, there's exactly the demographic they were trying to appeal to ended up being, I mean, you can see this now, the demographic that they alienated the most. Um, and then as I realized in graduate school that this was not a specifically American thing, as I learned more about social democratic politics in Europe, um, and, and also kind of heard center-left and social democratic politicians in Europe in the early 90s speaking in a way that sounded like Clinton, um, which itself is striking to me. Um, these are, these are um, politicians that are grounded in parties with very different histories. Um, and to hear them kind of speak in the same language, this language of progressivism, um, and trying to thread this trying to walk this line between being pro-market and being social democratic, which, you know, I think to many people um, were irreconcilable positions, um, was, it just struck me as a remarkable puzzle. And it seemed to me that there's so much emphasis um, in, on neoconservatism in the, around, the, around the early 2000s, the rise of Thatcher and Reagan and the, and the enduring effects of that. And it seemed to me that the more important thing that was going on, especially as you get into the 1990s, was the combination of, the, of a resurgence of center-left political power, electoral strength, mm -hmm. and this sort, of, um, this sort of odd hybrid, sort of almost Frankensteinish politics you know, that tries to marry pro-market politics to social democratic social principles of social justice and social wel welfare. Um, so that, that puzzle was really what trying to figure out how that happened and trying to figure out how it happened in a way that wasn't, um, that was analytical. Mm -hmm. um, so this is, this is often a problem we take up, you know, social scientists take up topics that are close to our hearts. Um, and we have, we have an investment in them. We have, there's a reason why we care about how certain things turn out. Um, and much of, I think a lot of literature, especially on third wave politics, it seemed to me that it was, it was both very informative, but it, uh, often it took this tone of, of who's to blame, right? Are they, um, you know, were they really social democratic? Was it was a betrayal of social democratic politics and principles? Um, have they have they have they let people down? Were they um, did they mislead people? Um, that was kind of the the question that I felt underpinned a lot of the existing research, and so I wanted to try to back off of that look at it historically and comparatively and try to understand not only why things happen in the big picture, but also try to get a sort of sense of, of why you would get this strange sort of historical figure, a person who is a committed, passionate socialist or social democratic politician, or in the Clinton's case, a committed sort of democratic progressive politician um, who pursues policies and supports policies or um, that that seemed to directly um, um, contradict that position 
and who themselves, they don't see it as a contradiction. Yeah. Right. To them, it seemed it seemed consistent to them. If you go with if you if you take what they said, you know how they accounted for themselves on their face, and that seemed to me itself important. How do you get these historical figures who are so important, who are doing things that, from a big historical perspective, seem to be so contradictory, but they themselves understand it as actually consistent with their their political commitments? Um, so that's kind of a long answer to your question, but yeah, and in a sense, I mean those contradictions make a lot of sense when you read your book because you go so far back in time and you trace these reinventions through time. So, I mean, for the, perhaps I'm going to overly simplify the argument, but the core argument, as I read it here, is that social democratic centre-left parties went through two particular reinventions in the post-war period. They had their roots in a kind of socialist agitation, um, and the core actor at that time was what you call the party theoretician. But then by the 50s and 60s, the economist, the Keynesian economist, takes a very central role in shaping and influencing policy within the center left. And then you have a more kind of neoliberal financial business turn in the 1990s, what, what we call now third wave politics. Um, but I think what's interesting about your argument, and perhaps we, we could develop that, is your argument is that central to these reinventions and central to this changing nature of social democracy as parties through time is, is, is our party elites and party experts and, and their influence over the kind of cultural infrastructure of the party. So perhaps you could tell us a bit more about that. Sure. Um, so so, so it's, the, the book is informed by a few different sort of theoretical, has a, a few different um, sources of, of theoretical input. And, um, you know, one of them is, a, a, I think if you're going to write about parties, you should read Gramsci, among <laughs> other people, um, and, um, and especially left parties, which is really what he's writing about is the Communist Party, not parties in general. And, um, and the centrality of intellectuals and experts as these sort of intermediary figures and left parties specifically, um, and not that, and I mean, all parties, you know, have these kinds of intermediate, intermediary figures who are maybe they're politicians, maybe they hold office, maybe they, um, maybe not, right? Maybe they're sort of um, background advisors or they're in the advisory networks of people who are seeking office. Um, but there's always these figures in any kind of, and parties need people who do the work of, Gramsci's brilliant on this, who do the work of, of figuring out how to translate the diverse experiences and situations of constituents um, and, and translate those into definite programs of action and then, and then incorporate those programs of action into, into the party's um, agenda and into its governing practices. Um, and it seemed to me that, that a lot of Lertrand parties kind of overlooked this figure. Um, well, what they didn't tend to do was sort of treat this figure as either all important or not important at all. And a lot of the debate was about, was sort of about like, you know, how important are they or should they be important, right? The question is should. Um, but if you look at parties, if you take Gramsci's kind of discussion of experts and you, and you look at parties in general, you always find these figures. They're all over the place. In some ways, they're so obvious now that you, you can hardly, you can hardly not see them, right? The world of consultancies and the strategists and the, you know, all the commentators and the pundits. And these are all people who have affiliations with parties and with, um, with politicians. Um, and if you, so, so I decided that was kind of an entry point. It was a good analytical entry point into a comparative and historical analysis of social, of social democratic or central left parties um, because they're these intermediary, intermediary figures, not because they're so important per se or they are causes of everything but because they're the ones who sit at the center of this process of translation, right? Yeah. Um, and, and so, um, and, you know, we all, and this is informed a little bit by, by Bourdieu and field theory, um, we, we all act on the basis of belief, right? We, we act on, we interpret the world on the basis of our experiences and our, our limited, you know, realities, right? And so we have these figures in political parties who, um, who are very influential, especially in center-left parties, because of the importance of translating the needs and interests of, of constituencies that are otherwise not well-resourced or otherwise not powerful. Historic, you know, they're not wealthy. They're not. I mean, historically speaking, this is yeah. you know, some parties supposed supposed to represent. 
And so you have these figures who are doing this incredibly important work who are themselves historical persons, right? Who have, who have their own story about how they become influential in parties, who, um, who have their own ways of interpreting the world. And so, so my approach was to try and focus on these figures um, in order to kind of understand um, the networks inside parties who do the work of interpretation of translation and of, tra and of, of building um, programmatic agendas. Um, and so when you look at that, the nice thing about, about European center left parties in this case is that they're, they're, con they're con the con continuous organizations um, as in, except for the German Social Democratic Party, which was in exile for a while, obviously. Um, I chose parties that were continuous organizations through time, and I focused on particular positions inside the parties. So the position of, of Minister of Finance or, or the British um, um, Chancellor of the Exchequer. Um, and, then, and then in the US, I handled it differently. I looked at advisory networks around political candidates and, and presidential administrations. And then I focused on their positions. How did they get to be there? What are their professional backgrounds? How did they become who they became? And what you find is this very, in the center, in the European case, is this very clear trajectory. In the, in the early 1900s, there are all these socialist agitators that you described, the figures I call party theoreticians, figures who never would have been intellectuals or public intellectuals of any kind had they not been connected to the formation of social democratic and socialist parties or the Labour Party in the British case. Um, and this is, you have to think also about the, the democratic situation and the technological situation. This is the time when the printed page is everything. So, um, so radical journalism is, is everywhere. Um, so there's a technological story to their trajectory. Um, and, um, and this is also a, a time when, when democratic institutions existed but were not full-fledged, right? This is before women had the vote. This is, you know, um, this is before, this is kind of in a democratizing period, right? And so, so these, so they had these figures who had no training in economics, who had no specialists. Some of them had some background in, in civil service, but in, in the British case, Philip Snowden had a background in civil service, but they became recognized as sort of socialist intellectuals and agitators because they were journalists, because they were editors, because they literally got up in soapboxes right, and, gave, and gave speeches. And what they were doing is they were speaking to people who they wanted to, who, who maybe they didn't, who, who in many cases didn't have access to the vote yet, right? Yeah. And so they, so they were trying to kind of socialize them to think of the world politically, think of themselves as political actors, and to see the world in a socialist or social democratic frame of reference, right? Yeah. They, were, they were training them to read their own experience, right, in a social democratic way. And right? it was very much about class struggle and class agitation and activity right, exactly. and interest on a class as people. And as you say, a period of democratization whereby many working class people didn't even have a vote yet, you know, depending right. on what time we want to look at. Yeah. Right. And, then, and then we have this transition, as you say, that, you know, as parties become formalized and these parties become relatively successful and, and, and in some countries, in, in the cases you look at Sweden, Germany, um, the United Kingdom and, and, and the United States, you know, they, they effectively hold office, um, which again is quite remarkable in a historical perspective. And then they become formal Then you have the war, you have all these disruptions. And along come the kind of Keynesian economists, the kind of what you call, um, if, I, if I remember this correctly, but they're party managers in a sense. They have one foot in the party, they have one foot in the professional scientific community, um, mm -hmm. and they become intermediaries, intermediaries between a certain scientific understanding of the economy and, and then parties themselves. And you know, it is quite remarkable that that these 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 economists take this role at that point in time. And I suppose it's really the fifties, and that's of course the peak electorally of, of social democrats that's when electorates had their or social democratic parties peaked electorally at least in europe um, mm -hmm. at that point in time right right and well the other thing about it was that it's a time when um when the when political control really sat at the national level um, mm -hmm. especially political control over over um over capital basically you know yeah. over um, over the and over you know transnational capital was sort of tamed and controlled by domestic political institutions at that time. So, so you had so you had this period of time when um, so part of the story that I tell is about the making of of these Keynesian economists, right? Is how they become how they were actually 
the revolutionary upstarts in the 1930s or in the 1920s when they were trying to tell um, party theoreticians inside social democratic parties who are actually fiscal conservatives. This is something that I really highlight in the book is that these were, these were folks who spoke with a Marxist economic language, but on economic, on budgetary policy, on fiscal policy, they were conservatives. So when, when the Great Depression hit, they were worried about balancing the budget. It was the same austerity politics that we saw, right, that we've seen yeah, um, since the financial crisis. And so they actually became the conservatives. They were opponents of fiscal orthodoxy. And it was actually sort of young economists, economists in training oftentimes, right? Economists who were, um, who were being schooled by their own sort of conservative, you know, fiscally orthodox professors who were knocking on their door and saying, look, you just, you, you, need, to, you need to start spending. Mm. You, know, you need to start spending now. You need to put money in people's pockets. You need to shore up unemployment benefits. You need to start spending. And, um, and they were shut out. And I tell that story um, for, um, for the European cases for British, Sweden, and, and Germany. And the only place where they aren't shut out is in the Swedish case. And the reason for that is the party leadership basically dies. Both the, both the Minister of Finance um, and the Prime Minister die. The, and they're sort of the old heads of the party. And so they, they create this vacancies, all yeah. right? And, and the next generation of economists that comes up is this sto the Stockholm School economists who are who are Keynesian before Keynes, um, who, who, who predate, who, who prefigure a lot of his, a lot of his arguments. And they were essentially the next ones in line to, to take power. So the next minister of finance um, is, uh, is a pro-spending, pro-deficit spending. And, and then, you know, Sweden embarks on this, its famous trajectory and, and the social democratic, social democratic party becomes the most successful social democratic party in Western Europe. And the argument that I make in the book is that, you know, what's happening is you have these particular kinds of economists who are actually, who actually have a language, you know, the language of, you know, fiscal policy versus monetary policy and, you know, unemployment versus inflation. What they're talking about here partly is about the opposition of economic interests in any kind of capitalist economy, right? Yeah. There's, the, you know, there's the people who worry about money and the value of money, and there's the people who worry about wages and employment. And these are people in very different economic situations. Um, they're different interests. And what the Keynesian, you know, sort of Keynesian language of balancing these things off, you know, and trade-offs between these two things, in a way, they're just kind of sublimating class politics. You know, it's just a different way of talking about the same things that the Marxists were talking about. You yeah, know? yeah. Um, so sorry, this is a little, sort of a long answer, but, um, but so, so the story I try to tell is like these Keynesian economists who then, um, you know, from some perspective are sort of understood as as moderates, right? What they're actually doing is they're is they're they're helping social democratic parties or central left parties govern in a way that balances off these competing interests um, at a time when when power to govern in that way did lie at the national level. It was possible to govern in that way. Yeah. Um, and so they, you know, they oftentimes didn't make everybody happy, but they also the way they the way they saw the world was well. My job as an economist, I call this the Keynesian ethic in the book. Right. My job as an economist is to is to balance off the requirements that political parties face, that governing politicians face, and balance it off using my own knowledge of how the economic world works. Right. Yeah. I give you trade-offs. If you do this, this is what will happen. If you do that, this is what will happen. Right. And sometimes themselves, especially in the Swedish and German cases, they're directly negotiating these trade-offs with unions. Yeah. Right. Or they're, or they're grounded in unions themselves. Right, so they see things in a certain way and they offer this sort of strategic advice, right? And they see that as their job, right? And uh, as opposed to, um, and I contrast this figure, the, the, the German, the West German Keynesian economist, I talk about a lot as Carl, Sch Carl, Carl Schiller, sorry. Yeah. Um, and I talk about how he sees, very, sees things very similarly to Walter Heller, who was the head of um, JFK's Council of Economic Advisors, you know, they see themselves as these figures that are like, well, our job is to offer these strategic trade-offs. You know, we make, we make economics work, we make politics work, right? Yeah. Um, and I contrast that with, with a generational peer, Milton Friedman, um, who was Heller's sort of public opponent, um, and how he says, no, you know, that the, the market is out there. Right. Yeah. The market is something that's up there. And the more you try to control it, the more you try to govern it, the more things are going to go badly. Yeah. Right. You can't actually govern the economy. Um, 
And so then I tell a story about how that worldview becomes dominant in the economics profession, right? And then you get a next generation of economists um, that, that think more in this way, who are more connected to finance and to international financial institutions and central banks than they are to unions or political parties or government agencies who see the world in terms of markets. And they're still social democrats. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. And I think, so in the, in the book you call this transition from, and I think, that, I think using this term, the Keynesian ethic, is quite useful because it captures more than just a kind of scientific understanding of how to manage the economy. The ethic is a kind of social norm and there's a kind of trade-off there. There's a partisan normative dimension to this. And of course, as you point out in the book, Keynes himself was not exactly a socialist, right? He, he, as you say, he was very much on the kind of liberal, liberal centre-right. But then with time, at least his economics and, and his policies became associated with more centre-left uh, economic management in what were typically the more corporatist countries. Uh, but so this shift towards a more neoliberal ethic with kind of business finance, the transnational financial economists and, you know, entering into third wave politics. But uh, perhaps we could talk about that in a moment, but I had a question on the, on, on the Keynesian ethic to, uh, a stage of this transition and in this first reinvention of social democracy. How important was it that you know, we have a particular type of growth model at this point in time, for want of a better term, mass industry, industrialization, the big factory. And it lent itself in many ways to a kind of a, a, a benevolent scientific social democratic approach to managing the economy. And perfectly captured, I think, in the Ren Meidner Swedish model of managing collective bargaining and wage setting. And, you know, I think people often forget that when they think about the heyday of social democracy in, in the 60s and so on, it was very much a centre, state-led, hierarchical approach to managing the economy. Um, but how important was it that those ideas were closely connected to unionised industrial collective bargaining factories, so to speak. Right. Um, well, the, 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 one of those questions that's, uh, I think, sort of impossible to answer in a final way. Um, one of the reasons I wanted to look, I wanted to include the American case for a lot of reasons, um, but one of them was because the Democratic Party has never been a socialist party. It's never been, uh, it's never had any formal well, for, for a time, it had a formal association with, with um, the AFL or with the CIO, but, uh, but that's really only a faction within the party, you know, that had that affiliation, that the American parties aren't sort of centralized organizations in the way that European parties are. Um, and, um, and, you know, this, this sort of question of whether it sort of depends on manufacturing, does it depend on, on the empowerment of of wage earning people, right? Does it depend on, on, on there being unions and union representation? Probably, yes. You know, I, I think that's, that probably goes without saying. Do you, does that depend on manufacturing? Mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know. You know, there's a union movement. There's a, there's a movement right now in the US to organize, you know, domestic workers and service workers and restaurants. And one of the main things that gets in the way of that is the fact that the legal structure that allows them to all be subsidiaries. So you basically can't make any claims on the actual owners of, of, um, of franchises because they've separated themselves through legal devices. Mm. You know, these are, these are um, structural obstacles that can be changed, yeah. right? And, and I, don't, I don't know that we have any good, I don't know that we now can say, well, those are institutions or the current, current economic institutions the current sort of business and um, economic landscape can't be unionized because we've had, you know, almost half a century of, of, of making it more difficult, yeah. at least in the U.S., to unionize those organizations. So, so I think it's, um, you know, I think there's, you can certainly make the historical case that manufacturing the rise of and the rise of wage workers who are working in the context of these big um, of big factories, you know, they're face to face, they're shoulder to shoulder, they're, you know, it's a setting that can be organized. Yeah. Um, I think that's incredibly historically important. Does that therefore mean that it's necessary once the economic landscape has changed? I don't know if you can, you can say that yeah. without, you know, um, I don't know, I don't know if that's really true because, you know, um, 
anyway, so, um, so I think that, you know, the other thing that's happening in the 1980s, and this was true here, and it was true when, for instance, the Swedish Social Democrats took their, went on their sort of neoliberal turn, um, in the, in the net, which was early in the 1980s also, unionization rates, especially in Sweden, they're incredibly high. Yeah. Right. The units are still pretty powerful. Mm. And from, and so, so one could make the argument, and this is what some of the stuff I try to document and from the perspective of the unions at the time, what they were saying was, was the problem is you pursue these policies that make it, that, that make us, that, um, that don't work in our interests, right? They basically, yeah. you know, third rate policies, one could argue broke the relationship, right? The cooperative yeah. relationship between organized labor and the parties. And then you see union decline. Yeah. Right. But of course you see union decline because suddenly union membership doesn't feel so sure that the union can represent their interest if they don't have a functioning relationship with parties and government. Right. Yeah. They can't. Right. So, so I try to at least introduce, um, I try to at least introduce a little bit of a doubt, right. About the, about that explanation or that argument that, well, this had to happen because the decline of manufacturing, the decline of unions yeah. and, and instead say, well, no, you know, you could have had, you could have had a different, politics when center left parties came to power in the 90s where they actually did things that supported unions yeah. and union organization rather than directly undermining them and i think that's a crucial point because if there's a, if there's a kind of thread in the book that i would say throws a skeptical eye on kind of it's all about globalization. It's all about skills-based technological change and social democratic parties are kind of dealt a tough card and they have to respond to it and they did it by adopting this coalition and this coalition. But your argument and this refraction approach which you have, which is looking through the lens of the political party is, well, actually, no, there's, there's diff these are, they have agency, so to speak, um, and, they can, and they can reframe and they can engage, which, and, which leads us then to the point whereby if this Keynesian ethic declines and this kind of the, 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 the Keynesian experts are moved aside and you have the rise of this kind of business finance transnational economic community and they become central to the kind of policy thinking and policy ideas of social democrats well then it makes sense that they didn't really want to hold on to the industry or hold on to um you know the, the, the collective bargaining structure because and from that perspective, these things are rigidities. There are institutions that need to be liberalized. You know, mm -hmm. China is there. Let's descent, let's let's offshore everything anyway, and let's move up the value chain. We're all going to be digital workers in the future anyhow. So it makes sense that social democrats would end up internalizing that language and those programs. And in mm -hmm. a sense, is, is that what happened with the kind of rise of the, again, to be simplistic about it, the neoliberal economists that began to shape the, these parties and claim that the market was autonomous and you know, parties just respond to what the markets want? Well, that's, I mean, the argument I make is, is, is that, um, or one of the sort of take home arguments that I, I formulate in the book is that these figures, they maybe, you know, often they are not elected, but they are representatives, mm. right? They, you know, as in they're, they're representing something, right? So, so Renan Meidner in, in the language of economics represented the interests of organized labor. Yeah. Right. They spoke for for their for their needs and interests. They tried to do it in a way that recognized the constraints of capitalism, and there had to be trade offs. You know, they they were they wanted to calibrate it to that, but that's they were representing the interests of of people. Right. It was in the the political technocracy. Right. It was. Which which again, like I don't I don't I don't think that's. I, I try to stay away from like was that good? Was it bad? I just think it was. You know. But yeah. I think they were speaking experts, academics in political life, they represent things. And what you got in the 90s were, it was, a, was a generation of economists, who many of them, if you read their own, I read you know, some of their own memoirs and commentaries and things, and they are committed progressives, right? They understand themselves to be, they, they will defend themselves as having, you know, they did the right thing, we did the only thing we could, right? Um, and, um, and uh, but, you know, what they were speaking for, the argument I make is that they were representing markets. They were representing this abstraction, yeah. right? Um, and, um, and so, and uh, you, can, you can see it if you, if you get into, for instance, I talk about the politics around, around the Mexican peso crisis in the American case in the, in the, in the 1990s um, and how 
um, Larry Summers and the people around him were saying there was kind of this, at the time, there was all this controversy over um, budgetary responsibility, right? That, that they were that, that they were all about balancing the budget. Clinton managed mm -hmm. to balance the budget. So on the one hand, there was no money to spend, right? We have to, we have to cut back on welfare programs. We can't give generous unemployment. We can't, right? We don't have money to spend. We have to balance the budget. On the other hand, if the Mexican peso crisis, if we don't bail out Mexico, if we don't spend a whole lot of money, which we don't have, mind you, to bail out Mexico, then, then the, maybe the markets, maybe people's sort of faith in markets and, and opening up to free trade will decline, right? Decline. Well, and so it wasn't, so they switch into this future tense. It's not about markets as they are, right? It's about sort of saving people's faith in markets, right? So yeah. that they continue pushing for free trade, right? And various deregulatory and liberalizing initiatives in the future. And what they're doing at that time is they're speaking, is, I mean, the way it looks to me is they're speaking for markets. They're representing markets in democratic life. Yeah, right? yeah. But the more they do that and the more influential they are, the less you have people, economists or anyone else, who's actually speaking for constituencies, hmm. right? The people who vote, you know? Yeah. <laughs> or should vote, yeah. right? And, and so one of the things that happens during that time is people stop voting. Declining goes, you know, the, and, and it's asymmetrical, right? It's especially people at the lower end of the income distribution. Yeah. Right, who, who who are voting less and less and less. I mean, that's not, not the only marker of alienation. But so so what I argue is that there's a relationship between these two things, right? If social democratic parties, central left parties of all parties, stop speaking for people and represent the markets instead, then people yeah. head for democracy's exits. <laughs> and this, of course, was exactly Peter Mayer's uh, insightful argument when on ruling the void that as parties become less responsive to voters and become more representative managers of what is in the interest of the market, then you're going to get a big uh, vacuum and a big void that somebody eventually is going to come along and try to fill with a highly responsive, we now call populist politics, um, which we could talk about perhaps in, in, in a moment. But it seems to me that the kind of, the, as you say, like the kind of neoliberal ethic, and you point this out in the book, that's not to say that these social democratic parties were conservative or neoconservative uh, by any, by most, and as you point out in the book, even most economists would self-identify, broadly speaking, on the center left. But something clearly shifted in terms of the imaginations of what governments can and cannot do. And it seems to me that in this kind of second reinvention, the idea was, well, production is for the market. Um, that's all about business finance. And we're going to liberalize capital markets. We're going to open up for investment. Let's decentralize. Let the financial markets do their work. The role of the state is to redistribute effectively. So the social democrats in government, you know, still kind of, you know, shifted maybe from a language of social justice to social inclusion. And we're very much not opposed to redistributing income in order to mitigate against rising market inequalities and so on. But automatically, you know, that meant that the levers of production and the levers of actual, the, 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 the pre-distributional phase was entirely left over and still is, I think, deeply ingrained in the imaginary of government that's really got nothing to do with the state and got nothing to do with politics, so to speak. Right. Well, the other thing about that, I, I think, is that there's, um, there seemed to be this belief that certain policies, especially if they were like well-targeted redistributive policies, um, or what, we're going to expand childcare, and that's grounded in research, right? We know that we know that childcare is great for for working parents. It's great for it's an investment in human capital, right? So, so they would this, and this is where I talk about the wonks a little bit, the rise of think tank experts, and you know the sort of third way pragmatism will do what works, right? And um, and on the one hand, it's a, it's a perfectly understandable and defensible position. You know, we know these policies are effective for these groups. And so we'll target, we'll target money here, we'll target money there. But it's sort of, it's as if they sort of thought the policies, the success of the policies would, would uh, make for a successful social democratic politics or progressive politics in the longer term. But that's not, that's very different from developing policies that are, that, that are both grounded in the experiences of say, you know, young families with kids yeah. Um, and, and that and that um, educate them along the way on on how the policies that are being developed are going to work on their interests or why they should support them. Or yeah. you know, so it's like they sort of thought, well, you know, the problem is a technical problem of redistributing money from here to there. 
if, if we go into recession, well, that's just too bad. We're going to have to cut back on everything. And that's just the reality of the markets, right? That's what the markets want, right? But so long as we can spend, we'll target money here and there. Um, and, and somehow that will sustain social democratic voters and social democratic politics in the longer term. That's not how you create a social democrat, right? It's not how you create a progressive. Um, they, have to, they, they have to actually be involved in the in the process, the deliber you know, deliberative process of making decisions on matters of economic policy and distribution and everything else. And the other thing is that if you then hit hard times and because you have to do what's best for markets, you say, you come back to those same folks and say, sorry, we're gonna actually cut back on all that. Yeah, yeah. So, so in the book, um, if I can, again, I'm overly generalizing and stylizing, but you seem a bit skeptical of, um, the kind of voter supply demand kind of political science approach that voters you know want something and we can measure that in terms of their preferences um, and parties supply policies to match those preferences um, and i suppose that, that at least in the kind of political science literature now the idea is that well, social democrats tend to cater to the interests of higher paid socio-cultural professionals, particularly in the public sector, in education, in healthcare. And that's the core constituency of the social democrats today. And if they did not have that core constituency, well, then they'd be in big trouble because they'd have nobody, because they've already been abandoned by, you know, industrial workers and the older working class. So, so in that sense, social democrats are in a bind because they have to tailor their policies to what higher income university professors want and not so much what, you know, lower paid precarious service workers want. Do you, do, do you think there's something to be said for that kind of supply demand voter explanation for the conundrum that social democratic center left parties find themselves in today? Um, so, to just put it bluntly, I, I don't think that democratic politics is a market. Mm -hmm. I just, I don't. I think, I think it misconceptualizes parties and how democratic institutions work. Um, it, it assumes that there's kind of voters over there and there's yeah. parties over there. And I don't think anybody who's ever been involved in politics experiences political life in that way. I think that it's more, it, it's, this is what I, what I use this language of cultural infrastructure to talk about how parties are actually organizations that extend far beyond the sort of technical boundaries of the, of the organization, right? Um, so in, in the American example right now, for instance, Fox News is part of the Republican Party. Mm. <laughs> you know, it, it is, it's not everyone at Fox News, but, organiz but organizationally it is in many ways the media, one of the media arms of the Republican Party. Um, and that was true, um, you know, that was also, that's, those kinds of extensions are, are a general fact of parties and party life, right? And there are, um, there are places everywhere you, you see this all over Europe where I've, where I've lived and traveled and you see it all over the US, there are places that are sort of imprinted Republican, right? That read as Republican. As soon as you drive into certain American towns, you see it all over the place, right? And it's not because people are putting elephants everywhere, it's because you can see it in how people dress, you can see it in people, whether or not people have American flags out front, you know, there's just kind of, there's a certain, it's a culture, yeah. right? And um, and that's true for, I think that's true in general of how political parties operate. It's how they sustain themselves over time. They have, it's why we call them the base, right? It's the people who are going to be loyal to that party no matter what, mm -hmm. right? And that's a cultural thing. That's an identity thing. These are not, these are not market participants who are just interested in buying what parties have to sell. These are part of their constituent parts of the party, yeah. right? Um, so... So I, I just, I think that a market kind of supply and demand metaphor is, is not only sort of historically and conceptually misleading, mm -hmm. um, but I think also to the extent that that way of thinking actually got incorporated into how politicians and parties think, that they thought of themselves in that way, that that was possibly even damaging, yeah. right? That, that it possibly accelerated um, the process of sort of alienation and political and you know sort of decline of faith in democratic institutions that you see now yeah so so i have i i have a i, I try to be gentle with it in the book because i know that it's a sort of respected paradigm in political science but i think it's i think it's 
I think you can make a good argument that's historically wrong, that it mischaracterizes the nature of parties and political life, and that if people in politics actually think that they, they decide that it's the correct way of thinking about the world, that it yeah, might do yeah. more harm than good. Yeah, no, I think, um, I think there's a lot of flaws, but I think it's, it's very, I think it's very true what you're saying. I think it comes back to the original point you made about parties and a kind of a, from a Gramscian perspective, that parties lead, that parties generate interest, that parties represent, and they don't just represent that in, in, in an objective way whereby preferences match, you know, policies. No, they have to generate and, and, and mobilize those, those preferences. Mm -hmm. and, and politics is ultimately a very complex strategic game uh, and it has internal factional struggles. And it makes sense that if the internal faction that said, well, everything matters, social investment is all what our voters care about, not social protection, and our voters are all higher income earners and they want liberalization and they want free trade, well, jump forward to the present moment, you know, and in certain countries like Germany, one of your cases, the Social Democrats, the latest I can see, they're polling at, I think, 15%. Um, and so I think, um, yeah, I think it's uh, the, the, the language that's used here can become self-fulfilling, becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy, so to speak. But maybe we can just um, branch out a bit then from, from the book. Um, and does it matter... Do, does, the, does the shifting macroeconomic paradigm matter? So again, it's, it's probably no surprise that we've gone from a Keynesian to a neoliberal, very different macroeconomic paradigm. Whether social democrats themselves were constitutive of that and shaped that shift is again probably broadly true, but it is what it is now. Do those, do those macroeconomic constraints, um, cons do they make a difference to the opportunity structure, so to speak, that social democratic parties have? And I'm thinking here very much in terms of the Eurozone. Is there something qualitatively unique about the Eurozone that further constrains the type of choices or type of party strategies that social democratic parties might pursue now if there is to be a third reinvention? Right. Yeah, the Eurozone is, it's, it's a subject of enduring fascination for me, uh, partly because of what I, I think that's a very important question. Um, so I do, I do think that, that it's very important, um, and I'm actually, to be honest, I'm, I've never been ha happy with my treatment of the German case in that period for this reason, because it's so clear of the cases that I deal with in the book, Germany is the only country that, that, um, that is, um, that is um, in the Eurozone, right? Yes. Yes. Um, and I just had a moment. It's good. <laughs> um, and um, and so and so the the sort of transnational finance oriented economists in the German case they're 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 not Germans actually they're at the ECB you know yeah um, which is a new institution right it's an institution that only started to exist in 1999 that you know it was basically just and um, and uh, and so what that meant in the German case was that you had these figures who were kind of um, they had the power and prestige of, for instance, um, you know, it may be comparable to the, to the power and prestige of Carl Schiller, right, in the 60s. Um, but they're not, um, they're not necessarily invested in the, in the specific, um, they're, they're not inter interested in the um, political future of the SPD. They're not specifically invested in the economic well-being of any particular class of people in Germany or any other place. Um, and they're moving in this this high this sort of new um, very sort of um, elite right yeah. um, professional circles that that were um, that were core to the making of the ECB and of the eurozone in the first place, and so um, and so this seems this seems incredibly important. You have the the people who are the most important interpreters of what's possible you know, it, under certain economic conditions or what's, what's economically and financially possible in terms of, um, in terms of policy making, these are people who have no particular investment in the future of democratic institutions and the yeah. future of that party. And they're, and they're, and they're not at all connected to constituencies on the ground. Um, so, so that's one thing that I think is really, is really, it's really important in the, in the case of, and this is sort of in, in the case of the Eurozone, that's institutionalized. You know, that's not, that's by, that's, that's a, a side effect of the design of the Eurozone, right? Which is not, um, it's not meant to be a sort of democratic sphere. It's a market, right? It's, yeah. it's an anchor of the so-called European market. 
right? And arguably it's a thing that makes anything called a European market even conceivable, right? Um, so, so, I think, so I think there's, um, there's something about that particular sort of professional and institutional world that it's hard to imagine people seeing things from the perspective of, you know, working class people in any particular country. Why would they? Yeah. It's not their job, right? Yeah. So I think that sort of culturally and professionally is important and the institutions themselves are incredibly important. Um, because what you have now is not only do you have central bank independence, right? But you have a central bank that that isn't that isn't even um, grounded in any particular domestic political context. Yeah. You know, you have a central bank that, in the name of market neutrality, actually has to be insensitive to the specific situations of any particular country, mm. right? Lest it should be accused of of not being neutral, yeah. right? And this is written all over the politics of the Eurozone right now with recent controversies over what the ECB has been doing. You know, is it, is it, is it favoring Germany? Is it favoring Italy? Is it, you know, when it's doing all of this asset purchasing and, you know, is it, because it's clearly not, if you look at the distribution of, of yeah. things that are being purchased, it's, it's not neutral, yeah. right? It's clearly intervening more in some economies than other for obvious reasons. And that makes it, you know, so I think the ECB, um, is, is sort of, it's caught in this space where even if it, even if people there wanted to be sensitive to the specific economic situations of this or that country or this or that group, yeah. it, it can't, yeah. right? And, and, I, and I think that, I mean, beyond just the question of like, can you have any kind of equitable, democratically sensitive economic management when you have no democratic account or sort of meaningful democratic control over monetary policy, that's a whole separate yeah. question. Um, it's a can of worms. But, um, and I think it, it seems to me that the, the kind of legal institutional infrastructure of the single currency um, and the creation of the European Central Bank, and of course, so much has changed, even in the past 24 months, even in the past few months, right? It's a very much a moving target. But, you know, it has you know, clearly negatively affected the, the opportunity structure of those countries that are not export oriented, right? I'm thinking, or predominantly export oriented. I mean, it might work if you're a small open economy uh, with a very, very small internal market, like a country like Ireland and, and Germany, of course, that kind of writ large being a highly unusual case of a small open economy that's very big. But I'm thinking here in terms of France and I'm thinking in terms of Italy. And in those two countries in particular, the center left has effectively, the center left parties have effectively disappeared. I mean, they have fundamentally collapsed entirely. Um, and, and they have been replaced fundamentally by entire new parties. Uh, mm -hmm. Or, you know, whether we can call Macron a party or some sort of hybrid social movement or whatever you want to call it, but it is. We, pro we, we will analyze it in a couple of years and we see a clearer picture of it, but they have, the center left have collapsed in these two countries. Um, but at the same time, they, the center left have done particularly well in Portugal and in Spain, which are two countries that were, were particularly badly affected by, by the euro crisis. So it seems to me there's no clear and there's no one determinate answer to all of these things. But I just wonder, maybe the center left have done well in Portugal and Spain because they have been challenged by parties further to the left. Basically, the left populist challenge has, 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 has forced them to, to change, has forced them to adapt, has forced them to develop a new discourse, and has forced them to develop a new language, which may, they may not have done only for this challenge uh, on the left. Right. Um, yeah, I think... This so I, I know a little more about Spain than I know about Portuguese case, but uh, but you know in both cases that you one has to think that it matters incredibly that they haven't been democratic countries mm. for as long, um, you know. So so the fact that they transitioned to to democrat that they had democratic transitions in the late seventies, um, early eighties. This means that that there's still plenty of people in both countries who remember a pre democratic. Mm. Um, period, right, a pre-democratic time. And they associate, I would imagine, because of the historical power of socialist parties in both countries um, at the time of the democratic transition, um, that, that those parties are associated with, with democratic possibilities, right? Yeah. And, and I know that in the Spanish case, for instance, voter turnout has been, it's, it's pretty high, participation has been pretty high, especially compared, I think, 
the last French elections, it was like 40% or something like that. It was something incredibly low. And you can't put too much, you know, voter turnout, it's not everything. But I do think that um, the fact that it's consistently in Spain for its whole sort of, you know, democratic period has been more like between 70 and 80%. I do think that tells you something. Yeah. Um, and so, so I think it, it does matter a great deal that there's a challenge to the left um, that has a serious following, right? Um, and so that, so I think you're absolutely right about that, that they, they see that this is a, a viable politics. They also see that, that they have, these are forces they have to contend with, that they can't just marginalize them. And I, I have to think that the specific histories of those two countries um, where there's a, there's sort of a generational memory, right. And association between, between, between democratic institutions and socialist parties that it must, that yeah. I have to think that must matter. Um, and I mean, in the French case, um, you know, the, the socialist party, I considered incorporating the French base into my book actually for a while, but I decided it was too complicated because um, it's had so many parties. <laughs> um, and so I ruled it out. But, you know, the, the French Socialist Party, um, I think, you know, sort of ceased to be much of a representative party a long time ago and in a way was sort of a leading force in both in the construction of the Eurozone and, uh, and of Europe's sort of pro-market or, you know, market liberalizing term. Yeah in the 80s and it's closely associated with these kinds of you know policies that aren't necessarily good for working people so yeah so i mean i think it's the portuguese and spanish cases are really interesting and it does how they fare how the social democratic parties there how the socialist party there fare will tell you a lot about what's possible in the eurozone um but then you know the counterbalance of that is like orban yeah right? which also tells you about what's possible in the eurozone right so um I'm not sure yeah. I'm not so I, I'm, I mean, there's a, I'm, I'm going to finish up now. I don't want to keep too much more of your time, but there's a great paper by, um, 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 oh, sorry, the name escapes me now. The title of the paper escapes me, but it'll come back to me in a moment. But the basic argument is that um, the rise of the radical right in Northern Europe in particular has split the working class vote um, alongside the rise of green liberal parties has kind of taken some of the social, so the social democrats center left are being squeezed on both sides, that they're losing their kind of traditional older working class vote to the radical right, and they're losing their kind of more socially liberal higher income vote to, to green parties. So in that sense, you know, they're, they're, they're stuck. And, you know, you, you probably know in Germany there has been arguments by many on the left that, you know, left parties need to develop a nationalist story, that unless they develop some sort of nationalist you know, uh, perspective, and they take a stand on certain things like immigration, uh, then they're going to basically be outflanked by the, by the radical right. Do you think there's any credence to that argument? Um, so I, I would prefer that they, that the debate was more about actual practice, as in, I think there's still a tendency to sort of treat the language of you know, policy language as and political language as a sort of as these buttons that you press, you know, yeah. and if you press if you press that button, you activate this constituency. If you press the other button, then you activate this other constituency. Um, and so this debate over what maybe they need to go more to the more to the left or more to the right or they need to become more nationalist or these are, this is sort of all about this. It's this language of the of, of political rhetoric as a bunch as buttons, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, or levers, right? And um, and so um, so I think I mean I think it's clear that you know for instance the German Social Democrat Party is not doing well. It's not appealing to people. It's not mobilizing people. It's not persuading people that they deserve to to govern. Um, but I don't think the answer to that is well maybe we need to push try pushing some different buttons and maybe those buttons should be the same buttons that far right parties are pushing. Yeah, I think that's I think that's a strategy that I think a it's questionable to me whether that will work right it, and b it's questionable to me whether that's something that they um, should do right yeah um, so you know I, I wish the discussion was more about about sort of practical everyday you know how grounded are we in local communities how many people do we have. Yeah. Right. Who are, do we provide? Do we provide places where people can go if they want to get involved in the Social Democratic Party? Are we open to youth movements? Are we willing to change over our party leadership? 
right? Or are willing to hand over the reins, right? To people who have, who, who have um, different perspectives and who appeal to people in a different way. Um, are, you know, and so, and so sort of things, matters of like, you know, entry and recruitment and pipelines and groundedness in communities. These are all the things that I think they should be worrying about. I wish yeah. they would talk about things in that way instead of questioning whether they ought to be pressing the same buttons that the far right presses. Yeah, and I think that probably relates back to your argument in the book on the role of kind of party experts or strategists, which basically are thinking always in terms of PR and whether I'm on the news this evening or how many tweets did I get retweeted this week. And I think this saturation uh, amongst the hierarchy of certain political parties, I think this is across the board, not just on the center left, um, you know, that, that, that this has... Um, yeah, this has led to a certain approach to party politics that is the opposite of what you just described, uh, so to speak. Final question, and then I, I will leave it up. So how do you get back to your, your home turf? Um, what's going to happen in the U.S. elections? Uh, well, I can, I can talk about my, my hopes and fears about what's going to happen. Sure. I mean... So, I mean, so, so I think if I had to lay bets right now, and mind you, I'm not an optimistic person, and I thought um, in the last election that I was one of the only people in my networks who thought that Trump was going to win. So let me just <laughs> put that out there. Um, and if, if there were an election right now, then Biden would win. But that's the kind of statement you make in normal times, right? Yeah. So right now... Right now, there's a few things going on um, that are exceptional. Obviously, the COVID crisis is itself an incredibly exceptional circumstance. The fact that you have what I call the Trumpification of the Republican Party, right? I'm, 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 I'm less, I'm not a huge fan of Trump, but I worry more about a party remade in his image yeah. in a two-party system. Mm -hmm. um, and um, and so so that concerns me, regardless of the 2020 election outcome. That concerns me in the longer run. Um, in the in the short run, what's happened since the Obama years was it is an incredible. And this is why the politics of the census in the U.S. are so important because it's the results of the census that allocate um, that allocate um, district seats. Um, and um, so. What happened since 2010 in the Obama years was, was an incredible effort on especially the Republican side, not only, but mainly the Republican side to gerrymander and suppress, right? To, re, to redraw district boundaries, to basically guarantee lock in Republican majorities, even in states that, that have clear majorities of non-Republican voters. Yeah. Um, and so, so that bears on the 2020 election because those institutions are still in place. They've been challenged. There have been a lot of legal challenges. There are things happening in Florida, for instance, with the enfranchisement of formerly disenfranchised or formerly uh, former felons who have been disenfranchised by the fact of having a criminal record. Um, so there are pushes against this. But but what's been happening since the twenty since the twenty ten census has been suppression, gerrymandering, you know, sort of rigging of the system in a way that weights things toward the Republican side. And that, on top of the politics over voting by mail, you know, all of these sort of efforts to cook up scandals over voter fraud, which is no matter how hard they look, they, they keep not being able to find. Yeah. Um, that worries me that, that even though, you know, even if there were election right now, that, that actually it would tend to tip the scales, right, in a way that can't be predicted by polls. Yeah. Yeah, yes, I can this 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 is a pessimistic reading, I suppose, or let's 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 finish by a grandkids <laughs> note that it's pessimism of the intellect, but we can have optimism of the will, so to speak. And right. That, that well, the optimistic thing is that there's been there has is such a push that there is democratic energy, and I mean like small d democratic energy as in, you know, there's been an activation of the voting public that that I think hasn't happened for a long time. Um, and there are a lot of smart people who, who know what's going on, who are, who are fighting it. It's just yeah. right now, everything is kind of hard to, to, uh, you can't take on everything at once. And right now the world's pretty overwhelming. So, I mean, a lot of those people are just hitting the streets right now, I think. Yeah. Yeah. 
Well, listen, this has been a fascinating conversation. Uh, I really appreciate your time. And uh, as I say to our listeners, it's a book that's really well worth reading. And uh, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you so much for having me. No, thank you.